Ok, hello. Un momento, un momento. Ah, ah, sí. Pronto, ok. Here we have uh, our friend, the Italian one, is that maybe the last uh, slide we will make a survival. <laughs> so he, now we will... A, di a dinosaur. A dinosaur. We decided to the right place to speak about fossils and dinosaurs. Okay, <laughs> it still exists as a good factory in Italy. So uh, now we uh, will hear about his, his history. <laughs> Well, in fact, it's not a factory constructing slide rules, but, uh, but I design slide, slide rules and I make them produce by, as I produce them in cardboard and plastic at factories working with cardboard and plastic. Okay, uh, to make things easier and shorter, I, I, I need to read my relation, but uh, I, uh, I hope, uh, I mean, it is not as brilliant as some of the relations we had this morning, but I, I hope you will, you will enjoy it as well. Okay, let me... Okay, this is a drawing we made uh, about 30 years ago when we used to produce the slide rules in cardboard for, as a gadget for magazines. So it was a, from a, a dépliant uh, for this activity. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with so many people from all over the world who share the passion for those marvelous fossils of science and technology that are slide rules. Personally, I have a collection of more than 300 slide rules and other computing devices, but here I will talk about my personal history as a designer and constructor of slide rules and surrogate slide rule type instruments. I was so lucky as to get in touch with slide rule, rules soon after I got out of the cradle. My father, a mechanical engineer, had always one in his pocket, and the larger one, a 25 centimeter Faber 317 at home. I can number the times I kept that mysterious tool in my hands, making the movable parts sliding one into the other, astonished by the precision of the lines and the numbers printed on its smooth surfaces. The use and the meaning of that object was unknown to me, a child of four or five years old, but I could grasp that there was something of great value in it. I also used the instrument for many practical and trivial work, as drawing lines with a pencil, recovering something from under an armoire or table, or gently beating, beating my little sister's hands when they tried to grab something of mine. All in all, that Faber's light rule exerted on me a form of imprinting that I'm sure conditioned my life somehow. I was, in fact, so lucky as to grow up in a family fully living the tradition of the Enlightenment, where science, technology, and an independent use of reason were highly considered. So I became very soon an amateur astronomer, a reader of science books, as well as of science fiction books. It's worth telling that the formation, in the formation of a young mind, very small stimuli can produce big effects. For the formation of my prone to math mind, not only my father's light rule, but also picture cards play the role. Today, youngsters collect almost only football players' cards. When I was a child, there were a series of cards and albums on subjects as astronomy, biology, and mathematics. The amusing number album here represented that I hardly, hardly completed in a month of collection probably produced in Italy more mathematician than any math course in the primary school. For sure, it has an influence on me. As an amateur astronomer, I develop an interest in the ancient instrument used by astronomers and particularly in sundials. I learned as a teenager how to construct them, and when I was 24, I tried to transform my passion into a work, producing usable replicas of the instruments of the Renaissance sold as toys. The initiative has some success, and in the following years, I produced various editions uh, of those instruments, and finally 600,000 series of 20 or so usable astronomical instruments in cardboard or plastic attached as gadgets to an encyclopedia of astronomy. In the same period, I produced 
uh, 650,000 plastic sundials for an important weekly magazine. This could be a Guinness record as far as sundial production is concerned. I doubt that in the 18th century someone could produce 650,000 sundials. <laughs> My most technical production in this field was a series of astrolabs for eight latitudes offering a special feature of graphically representing the position of the true sun in the, for, in the form of the small lemniscate or figure eight shaped curve on the transparent cursor, a feature I have never seen in any other astrolab. Another high-end product production was the planetario tascabile Oeply. Where is it? Here. Okay, this is uh, the Astrolab. Another high-end production was the Planetario Tascabile Oeply, designed and produced for the Oeply, a major publishing house which specialized in scientific books. This planetarium is a special universal Astrolab that is working at all latitudes, designed around an orthographic projection studied by the Spanish Juan de Rojas y Sarmiento in the 16th century. A simple popular instrument was the Trova Steller, a star finder, composed of two extremely cheap pieces of cardboard, offering a vision of the sky valid for two fundamental latitudes of the Italian territory, one on each side, the sky being represented both as, as, uh, in a normal map and as a blank map. In the early 80s, I extended my production, my production to replicas of the instrument of navigators and topographers of the past. So I produced the kit orientation navigation topography, including more than 30 carbon instruments among them, many slide rules with logarithmic scales, a time distance computer, and computers to be used in various sports and activities. I am an airplane pilot since my youth, most specifically a seaplane pilot and the author of many technical and historical books on water aviation. So I couldn't help testing myself in the design of some types of aviation computers. In the 80s, I produced an advanced pilot computing and plotting kit, including among many plotting instruments, a typical flight computer with a logarithmic scale side and the wind side, the latter allowing a graphical solution of the wind triangle. Other logarithmic slide rules to compute various data of interest for the pilot were included. A very complex computer to establish the takeoff run, a maneuver affected by quite a number of parameters, was designed but never produced. This is the only prototype existing. Another, another important kit I produced, still for the Oeply Publishing House, is a rich compendium of instruments to construct some dials, including a series of computing slide rules to design all types of normal and strange lines on the dial, various instruments to compute data related to time and calendar, many cardboard sand sundials, and a few plastic instruments to be used in the field to construct sundials. It is to be noted the general philosophy of those products. The, the general philosophy of those products was to offer instruments that could be readily used by amateurs of different disciplines and in the field of education with an extensive documentation, but at a very affordable price, thanks to the cheap cardboard production, occasionally with some printed plastic parts where, when transparency was fundamental. To give an example, my navigation kit with the, its 30 and more instruments cost half the price of a single plastic aviation computer. 
In the glorious 80s, all magazines and newspapers in Italy competed through the offer of gadgets. In those years, I produced dozens of paragraphs on the most disparate subjects, many of which with the computation function, that is, logarithmic scales. Examples, slide the rules to establish the most suitable diet, to learn how to use a pressure cooker or microwave oven, to choose the right combination of food, to calculate woman's fertility period, to know the correct use of sun cream depending on the user's skin type, where to look in the sky to spot the Halley Comet, how to compute the rate of ex exchange or the performance of an investment. And so on. I produce uh, those and, and uh, more than 100 of these or such instruments. As it can be imagined, I did not invent all the slight rules I produced, resorting in some cases to well-tested design of the past. This is the case of the distance computers I prepare for Italy and the USA, thanks to the passions of my sister, who had to place something like 3,000 dry transfer digits onto a disk of three and a half inches of diameter. Each one at a precise place and with a precise orientation. It was hard to design uh, slide rules once. <laughs> Probably the strangest slide rule I ever designed was, at, as it could be called in English, the governometer, con conceived to compute the possible governments to be formed after general elections. <laughs> Italy is a complicated country where tens of political parties compete for a place in the sun, hence the need for serious calculations. This instrument presented also a logarithmic scale to compute a datum normally hidden and disliked by politicians intended to answer this question. Given the percentage of non-voters and unmarked and spoiled ballot papers, by what percentage of the whole voting population the winner has been elected? So it became very simply computable that the government could be a, the expression of just 20-25% of the population, rising issues of political philosophy about the social system in which we live. In any case, this has been produced in 200,000 uh, pieces together with uh, a national magazine. In many cases, I produced more than uh, half a million pieces of a specific gadget of this type. This was happening just a little time after millions of slide rules had been made suddenly obsolete by billions of uh, electronic calculators, as we know well. To be noted that electronic calculators did not really occupy the whole scene, leaving to slide rules a function when non-numerical information had to be presented or when very specific computations were involved. In addition, those gadgets printed, printed in joyous colors and embellished by images played a role in popularizing the slide rule, no more a cryptic instrument reserved for the rarefied levels of engineers. The second life I gave in Italy to the slide rule or to objects resembling slide, slide rules very closely was perceived in 1986 by the J. Walter Thompson Company, the world's leading marketing communication group, granted me the David Campbell Harris The Future of Communication Award for my report, Second Generation Slide Rules, Interesting Application in the Field of Mass Communication and Advertisement of a Sophisticated Technology of the Past. It is really curious and obviously a source of satisfaction that in the year of space and electronics one could win a prize awarded by a big communication company for a technology invented three centuries before. Before talking about what I'm producing in present times, I would like to expose an amusing experiment I made as a member of the CICAP, the Italian Sister Association of the American CSI, the Committee, Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, whose mission is to, to promote scientific inquiry, 
critical investigation and the use of reason in examining controversial and extraordinary claims. The idea was playing a joke on the levels of legendary archaeological finding, findings, such as the Baghdad Battery, or on those who believe that pre-Columbian civilization had been regularly visited by the aliens. So I prepare a circular Babylonian logarithmic slide rule working in accordance with base 60 system and carved with cuneiform figures. Here is, a, in the proceedings, there, is, there are all the, the tools to make one of these that has been prepared by our dear friend Wolfgang for the event. And I presented it as an ancient artifact forgotten in the ship of an expedition of archaeologists traveling from Latakia to Venice in the 20s. The story of the discovery was based on real facts and supported by an old album of picture document, documents from the ship captain who had come into possession of the material and notes from the president of the Italian Mathematical Society who endorsed the discovery. The artifact was a demonstration of the fact that Babylonians had the theoretical knowledge and the practical know-how to invent and produce the slight rule two millennia before the, it was reinvented in the Western civilization by William Oughtred. I easily succeeded in demonstrating the assumptions, the assumption that Babylonians were capable in managing logarithms. Mathematical documents in the form of clay tablets found in the Fertile Crescent proved my case. But the artifact, the old album, and the letters were all fake as they had been created by myself. <laughs> Of course, the, the, the fraud has been immediately declared as such, of course. <laughs> Another instrument I designed as a member of the community of the skeptics was a zodiacal sundial showing not the days of the entrance of the sun into the zodiacal signs, but its entrance into the zodiacal constellation and among them, the outsider of Yucus, unfairly excluded in the classic zodiac, despite is included, in fact, in the, in, the, in, the, in the belt of the zodiac. I have now to make a confession. At a certain point, I have been requested to design a set of instruments to make horoscopes. I completely disbelieve in astrology, but designing such a special astrolab was a technical challenge to me, even though similar instruments were realized centuries before. I gave myself to... Is the Astro computer, computer. I gave myself two excuses for this blasphemy. First, I just had to design an astronomical instrument indicating the moment the sun enters into 12 houses, which are precisely defined sectors of the sky. I said to myself, producer of knives intended to be used in the kitchen is not responsible if one of his knives is used by a husband to kill his wife or vice versa. <laughs> so I am not responsible if an astronomical instrument is used to prepare horoscope, horoscopes. Yes, I have to admit, this smells of hypocrisy a mile away. And this leads me to my second excuse. Even the great Galileo Galilei had to make a horoscope now and then to carry on with his family. The question is now, in today's technological landscape, what could be the role of analog computers, that is, slide rules? Certainly, a slide rule type products, which present data in a graphically pleasant way, occasionally with a computation capability, can continue to be used in the educational field and as a cheap gadget. I present here as an example an aromatic herbs computer of which I produced 25,000 copies last year as a gadget to be given to every visitor of a, of a botanical fair. It's for sure not a computational device, but for the people it's a slide rule, a regolo in Italian, and in some way it will help keeping the concept alive. For the record, it was very appreciated and will be conserved in tens of thousands of homes. 
Indeed, we are dealing with a material object, maybe old-fashioned and naive, but something that has substance, fated, fated to exist for centuries, thus having some value, be it large or small. We are not dealing with pixel flowing on a screen for a few seconds, thanks to software that will be likely unavailable within weeks of months or a year. Let us note now that there is a field in which a classic slide rule is still in use, aviation. One could wonder why this happens. Let's say that when one needs an approximate but quick solution to a problem, this is exactly the case when we're flying an aircraft, and an instrument whose functionality must have a 100% reliability, a slide rule can honorably accomplish the task even better than a complex programmable computer. Let's remember that it is important to be able to rely on a device that does not depend on anything, electricity included. For the same reason, pilots prefer to use a stick to measure the fuel level rather than trust the electromechanical level indicators. In the specific field of aviation, the slide rule in the form of the flight computer belongs to the equipment of every pilot and it still use and and uh, its use is still taught in flight school. Unfortunately, only few continue to use it after their exams and rely more and more on complex devices in the cockpit, cockpit and on the instrument panel. One of the side effects of these intricate devices is that their setting requires a good deal of time and attention, as a result of which pilots look less and less out of the window of their aircraft. All in all, a simple instrument made out of three discs, disc of cardboard or plastic, but with an infinity of calculation possibility, can still play a practical role in the life of a pilot. I would like to add that it is the opinion of many that the younger generation are less and less capable in using their hands, as they are used to living in a virtual world of pixels and are accustomed to ask computers for quick solution to any problem that might arise. As a reaction, there is now a tendency to step a little back and offer the youngsters the pleasure of understanding and managing themselves the processes they are involved in in our case, through the use of slide rules. That's why flight examiners more and more often switch off all modern cockpit equipment and say to the candidate pilot, now take your map, your chronometer, your flight computer and plotter and take me to this or that destination. It happens more and more. This concept induced me to design a product for the prospective pilot to promote aviation within the general public. People interested, eager to know and understand, but not, at least not yet, involved in the field. Is the future pilot starter kit now in the pre-production phase? The kit comprises a brochure presenting, presenting all possibility, possibilities of becoming a pilot, of the various flying machines, a 224-pages uh, book with all the basic aviation knowledge explained in simple terms, an atlas of aviation communication, a 10-feet long sheet with the history of aviation, various minor gadgets, and a series of slide rules to make computation of various kinds. Two words on the instrument which I will which will be produced before the end of this year. One is the classic flight computer with several minor improvements. It is supplied in two editions, basic and advanced. This is the basic, and this is the advanced. So that the prospective pilot will not be scared by his or her first glance at the instrument and to allow a step-by-step -step approach. This is obtained with just the substitution of the upper disk. The computer has a wind side used to compute those components of the wind which are interesting for a pilot, that is the crosswind and the headwind or tailwind. 
The performance computer is a new product allowing the user to compute data about turns, climbs, and descents. This computer can have an important role in the safety of flying, as many potentially dangerous flight situations can be easily simulated in exercises in the comfort of an armchair, so that the pilot is prepared to face them when they occur in a real flight. In the use of these instruments, all the advantages of uh, an analog computing instrument, that is a slide rule, become evident. With a slight continuous movement of the fingers, the parameters vary in a continuous way, and the results we are interested in are automatically displayed as well in a continuous way. It's only a matter of looking in the proper places of the scales during the movement of one disc over the other. Simple, quick, effective, and very elegant. Using an electronic device, all data must be input for every single variation. These are other instruments included. A nomogram couldn't be missing. In the book of the kids, at the end, I have included four pages summarizing the history of slide rules, explaining all their features and why they can continue to be faithful companions of a pilot. Picture, pictures you surely know. The kit, when distributed through association as the Experimental Aircraft Association of the Aircraft Owner and Pilot Association, will include a special gift, a replica with its case of the 1943 computer type D4. This slide rule was used by uh, World War II pilots of the B-17 Flying Fortress, the P-58 Mustang and other aircraft of the time. <laughs> Even if the readers do not use the computers within the, the kit for computation, at least the D4 replica will survive as a historical curiosity on the desk of thousands of people and might imprint on some young mind as it happened to me with my father's Faber 317. For the future, I have been thinking for a dozen years about producing a serial a series of uh, 20 or more small kits on the theme of mathematics, aimed at young adults and passionate adults. They will include the slide rules in several cases. It's an ambitious and demanding project that in the last year I had not the time and energy to develop, but it could possibly represent the last of my production and the top of my career as a designer of scientific education products and slide rules. Mathematical knowledge needs to percolate into forming minds through play, toys, curious stories, and strange and intriguing objects. And I am sure that familiarity with mathematics produces mental order and the habit to use reason in managing one's own life. In other terms, mathematics produce better men and women for our future societies. That's why I, I guess that this series could be remembered as the most useful, useful of my productions, if I succeed in realizing it. Another project I am very slowly developing is a book on slide rules, including a catalog of my productions, having a title such as The Last of the Mohicans, Memoirs of a Slide Rule Designer, but the project on mathematics has the priority, of course. To conclude, I grew up during the twilight of the slide rule era, but I felt an irresistible, an irresistible attraction for those intriguing objects, every slide rule being a small universe giving a sense of precision, completeness, and elegance. And I tested myself in trying new ways to make those objects live and evolve in order to offer some kind of service. What I can say is that I got a lot of satisfaction and amusement for this activity, and it's really a pleasure to know that there is a well-structured organization, such as the Otra Society, with, it, with its mission of preserving this noble and magnificent tradition. Thank you. Two.
a technical communication, the, um, the way of displaying on a computer a slide rule with, it, uh, with its uh, possibility of um, moving the parts has been studied by my son Tommaso who is present here. No, just to walk. And uh, I also brought, uh, um, I could brought a, a gadget for everybody. Uh, well, this is, doesn't represent really my production because it is a, peri a simple paragraph is that I produced last year, but uh, I had 1,000 more not used. <laughs> so I, I, I just uh, took one for anybody, for everybody of you as a gadget, and I have it here. You can, you can get it later. <laughs> <laughs> no computation function, but in any case, it's something that uh, will help keeping uh, the tradition alive. Yeah, still, still, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, we'll get to this one first. Uh, see, there are a lot of your designs there. I only ever saw one that had a copyright. How did you ensure that your designs just were? Good question. What I always thought that it is this field is such a niche that it's impossible that something like that will be copied because when you produce it, you immediately fill the market. In the case of a, a gadget for a magazine producing 400,000 pieces, it goes in the market and the business is finished. In case of the production of the educational kits, as those you have seen there, uh, is something so difficult to, produce, to, to design because it takes months and months. And the market is comparatively as so small that it is very difficult that someone will copy this. So I never uh, put no copyright on patents or something like that. I knew. Uh, I, uh, in, my, in my life, uh, I had only one product copied, but it was a different case because I produced uh, an astronomical umbrella working as a planetarium with, uh, with the sky inside so you could turn the umbrella and see the sky. Some Spanish copied it and <laughs> distributed throughout uh, Europe, so uh, they made a better business than I did, but uh, it was the only case because it was a, a a relatively simple product. How do you produce your, um, your scales, math scales? Uh, uh, like the one you've just shown. Well, uh, at the beginning, I just uh, uh, copied the scale existing from, uh, from existing slide rules, mostly circular. In some cases, rectilinear, but mostly circular. Uh, but uh, later I started to compute for every line the angle and the coordinates and put them uh, in, uh, in, um, in the right place. With some kind of graphics program or writing? Uh, yes, uh, uh, at the beginning uh, I used the Texas T59. Mm -hmm. to, I, used the, I used it to, to produce uh, uh, both slide rules, but a much more complicated program to design sundials. And uh, eventually, I used the uh, normal program we have in, the, in, in our computers. The books are still. Uh, Excuse me? You have the books here? Uh, which, which book? Uh, well, uh, well, the book, uh, the, the kit on aviation is the, the one that will be marketed since uh, 2017. And it, it's a box with uh, a book, a brochure, and uh, a dozen of other, of other uh, objects, including uh, all, the, all the slide rules. Um, the kit on the sundials and the planetarium is uh, uh, still marketed by the Herpley uh, Publishing House in Milano and can be bought. All the rest, uh, I have only samples because uh, they, they have been sold in the 80s, in the early 90s. So, uh, the question is, uh, 
Yesterday, I was reading my news uh, online, yesterday morning, and uh, I came across a news article about um, a naval uh, stunt, U.S. naval stunt pilot, and he was preparing for an air show with a group of, yes, and um, he was practicing a few days before the air show, and he made a couple of mistakes. And the first one is that he started his maneuver at too low of an altitude. And the second one is they had the wrong speed. And what he was doing was a barrel roll, going up like this and twisting over and coming down. Coming into the ground. And he went right into the ground. Of course. Yeah, it happens. If he had one of your flight computers, do you think he would have avoided that? Well, if, uh, probably if uh, in, uh, in front of his fireplace, used to play with my performance computer, probably he could, he could simulate very easily all the situation about uh, climb, diving, and uh, forces during turns. So with the stall speed increasing and so on. So maybe that some exercise could have helped him. Next <laughs> question. Uh, there, there, there is another interesting story about aviation in the last week. Uh, ten days ago, an aircraft uh, uh, departed from Sydney to go to Kuala Lumpur and uh, went to Melbourne because the data were uh, erroneously input in the, the flight uh, data in the flight computer. And uh, I mean, with, uh, if, if you navigate with uh, the, 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 navig the, the aviation computer, this cannot happen. Unless you become crazy. <laughs> Thank you.